Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. I'm Sylvia Earle, oceanographer, ocean elder, <laughs> founder of Mission Blue, and friend of Liz. <laughs> I should hope. Thank you. <laughs> this is our show, Dive In, um, where we host informal, open conversations with members of the ocean community on topics of wonder and interest. And now comes most wonder and interest part is where I attempt to share my screen. <laughs> Diving, I mean, driving submarines is really easy, right? Amazing, but, but sharing screen really tricky. Yeah, everybody's gotten really good at it, and and uh, powers through the glitches that happen too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as we get through the conversation today and and move through, uh, you can ask any questions that you would like to by using the Q and A box, and then at the end of the program, we'll get through as many questions as we can, and throughout the conversation. Uh, there'll be some links posted in the chat box for additional information. And before we get underway, remember that the world is blue. blue. <laughs> she always Never. wears blue, and I usually forget to, but. Oh, but your heart is blue. Yeah. Oh, why aren't we? Uh, Here we go. <laughs> We're diving in. We're diving in. Yeah, absolutely. We're diving in today and just looking at this uh, wealth of growth here where this diver is yeah you'd think that if this was a, it's just like a piece of a coral reef except for those big structures in the back what is that anyway exactly and columns it looks like it could be a cathedral but no what we're looking at is actually in the gulf of mexico about 100 miles offshore that place that is dotted with oil rigs some they started out on shore but they sort of began tiptoeing offshore in about 1947 and into the sea now the, some drilling operations are taking place in water depths that is just at the start the water depths of more than 10,000 feet and 3,000 meters or so and strangely maybe not strangely whether it's a piece of driftwood, a sunken ship, or these, these new things in the ocean, the rigs that have been established in my lifetime. None existed when I was a child, but now in the ocean around the world, from the Persian Gulf to the Gulf of Mexico, the Mediterranean has some, and certainly the coast of California. And we're going to hear a bit about that, but just take a look at the profusion of life. The fish don't care. It's a place to set up housekeeping and have their little families. <laughs> Some of them actually have their nests. And once in a while, a really big fish shows up. And Why? Because that's where the action is. They, it, they... it truly is. And, and today we're going to be joined by Amber Sparks and Emily Hazelwood, and they're from Blue Latitudes. Um, Emily and Amber, can you share your video come, camera? Come on, board. come on, join us, dive in with us. Here you hey, are. There you are. <laughs> hey, Sylvia. Hi, Liz. Happy to be here. Oh, yeah, so it's great, great to see you too. Having you come on board. <laughs> <laughs> so we worked. We, I've worked with uh, Amber and Emily on some projects in the past. They helped us with the underwater pavilions uh, project at Catalina, which was a wasn't oil rigs, but it was still a big installation <laughs> of a very different purposes. And um, we've collaborated in some other projects, ROV projects and such over the years. So it's great to have both of you here. This um, is not their picture that's on This the is not their picture on the no, screen, I mean, but we're gonna show, I think next we're gonna show a little- have dots. Yeah. Wish that was ours. <laughs> right? This is theirs. I have right. to click it first. We're diving in. Yeah. So this is- This is in uh, yeah. California. So this is other side of the country. See the, it's, but it still, it looks like a banquet. Yes. I mean, each of these members of the, of the, the struts and, and other elements that make up the rig are, become just, just packed with life. It's, it's really an incredible that, you know, you first you see the, when a fresh piece of metal comes into the ocean, whether it's from a, you know, wrecked ship, a lost container, um, or something that's intentionally put there, like a, an oil and gas platform, 
then that's a piece of substrate that right. the animals will, and plants and animals will often settle out onto. And the oil industry had no, I, <laughs> probably no idea that this was going to happen. It was, they did not intentionally create an artificial reef. But no, and as a diver, it's so unexpected. You know, you pull up to these structures and you see what's above the surface and you hear them, they're active, and you see the crew boats pulling up and it, you know, it just looks like this gigantic steel structure. But then you go below the surface and it's just rich marine life. Yeah, and you can see just how much it is just incredibly populated. And, you know, it seems like the, the settling animals start first and then the fish quickly come in and and the uh, small fish come and the big fish follow. <laughs> right. Yeah. Normal. The normal procedure, right? Yeah. So. We, I wish we saw the same uh, whale sharks like you might see in the Gulf of Mexico, but it's really interesting wherever these platforms are placed, they mimic the environment in which they've been placed, like many other artificial reefs do. So here in California, we see the scallops, anemones, mussels, cold water corals, very different from what you would find in the warm tropical waters of the Gulf. But similarly, heavily, uh, you know, heavy, heavy growth on them. And I yeah. know that, I know so many times we'll hear from, from the, um, you know, the commercial divers that work on these platforms in the Gulf of Mexico that often there, there's a resident uh, Goliath grouper or, or two that, that just kind of hangs out there. And they have great, they actually make great sport of coming up and kind of, you know, nudging <laughs> <laughs> one of the, the divers. Are, are we? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, some of the, some of the divers have actually gotten the habit of taking a you know, hot dog or, or something in their pocket to sort of fend these guys off. And, and they've learned, they're just like a big dog. They've learned that if you come down there, you don't have food, then you're going to get the, you know, you get nudged to, to <laughs> you kind of ante up, you know? <laughs> so how did you, how did you get it started with this? business of looking at reefs, reefs look at the as reefs. I think they've got the map here. Oh, yeah. yeah, you know, my first experience was it was right after college, I got an opportunity to work um, on the BP oil spill as a field technician. So we were doing biota sampling and water sampling and sediment sampling to fully understand the extent and the impact of the oil spill. And during that time, BP had hired a lot of the fishermen who could no longer work in the Gulf during that time to drive our sampling boats. And each time we'd be out there, they'd be just saying, you know, I can't wait to get out there and fish these platforms on the weekend. And we're thinking, what? You want to go fish on these platforms that cause this spill? There's no way those ecosystems and those reefs and those fish can be healthy for you. And that's when I first learned about the Rigs to Reefs program was my time in the Gulf and what a rich part of the community these oil platforms and these ecosystems were. And so when I came to California and I met Amber, I learned that the California also had 27 offshore oil and gas platforms is depicted on this map. And yet, unlike the Gulf, we weren't reefing any of them. The Gulf has reefed over 500, but California had reefed exactly zero. Hmm. And, and we're, we're, <clears throat> no, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say we met at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where when I heard about Emily's background and you know, here on this map, you see the black triangles, those represent active oil platforms, but the red ones are inactive, which means that they're nearing decommissioning. And with this de massive decommissioning right on the horizon, we were, it was very curious, are these structures similar reef ecosystems like we see in the Gulf? And if so, what's, what are the economic and ecological implications behind actually reefing them? So, the great thing about grad school is that you get to really dive into these questions and we were able to work with doc, Dr. Milton Love's lab up at UC Santa Barbara, as well as with our colleagues down at Scripps to get to the bottom of this and really begin our research. And from there is where we really discovered uh, how prolific and amazing these structures are as reefs. And we then expanded that from just looking at California to looking at platforms around the world and through our LLC Blue Latitudes, as well as our foundation, the Blue Latitudes Foundation. And what, what goes into a reefing a platform? Well, reefing is, the, is very similar to decommissioning it entirely. And when I say that, basically that means at the end of the productive life of an oil platform, um, the oil company will make the decision to completely remove it. And instead of completely removing it, if you reef it, you seal and cap the well in the exact same way as if you're going to totally remove it. 
And the oil company is always on the hook for that well in perpetuity. So should there ever be a spill in 30, 40, 50 years, they're always going to be responsible. And unfortunately, the risk is always there because we've drilled this yeah. well. But the risk is no greater than if you refit versus totally removing it. When you refit, you basically have three options. You can either tow it to an alternative location to create you know, a reef hot spot or you can remove the upper 85 feet of the structure and leave it standing in place, or you can topple the entire thing on its side. And when you're toppling this structure, the only thing we're talking about is the jacket or the beams and cross beams of the platform. And they're very complex and marine life is naturally attracted to that complex structure, which is part of the reason they make for such good reefs. Mm -hmm. Like shipwrecks. Exactly. Right. And, you know, and it's, I mean, there's the kind of case to be made for it because if the platform has been out there for any length of time, it it is quite heavily encrusted. And if you're removing the entire um, platform, you'll be removing all that ocean wildlife as well. And you know, then it's just it, so it just seems that um, you know, if you've got 40 or 50 years of growth on some of these platforms, that it makes or more that it makes sense to to try to keep that intact. Well, there are trade-offs. If if I we're the big boss of the world. I would say they should not be there in the first place. If if you really sure. are thinking like an ocean and saying it's true with shipwrecks and all the other junk we put in the ocean, it doesn't. I mean, it's all of human origin, and it does have consequences. Uh, most of these rigs are fundamentally structures made of iron. In fact, in the Gulf of Mexico, it's known as the steel archipelago. And when iron rusts, it sometimes has negative um, impacts on, on the local residents. In time, as you could see with these rigs, they get encrusted and sealed off and the rust does not continue in an obvious sort of way. But as a scientist, I can't tell you how often I have wished to be able to have a vertical transect in the ocean mm -hmm. that is in place, but I don't have a gajillion dollars to build such a structure or structures in strategic places to look at a number of, of issues. One, how long does it take for a system to form? And what is the, the process of colonization? And can you get age determination, at least a minimum age and size of some of the organisms like the sponges and the corals? You, you don't know a maximum size, but at least you have a, a minimum age of, of how, you don't know when they actually settled if you're looking at something that's been in the water for 50 years, but they can't be any older than 50 years. Right. So that's, you can use that as kind of a baseline of the, the biggest ones can't be more than 50 years old. And, and you did some work, similar work to that in, in Truck Lagoon where- Looking at a shipwreck. Looking at shipwrecks where you were able to come along and, and purposefully you know, sample an area and kind of clean it off and then come back uh, at a later time and, and gauge the rate of growth um, and the, comparatively the, to other mm -hmm. uh, animals that were in that area. And, and even to look at the existing growth with that idea of the, the biggest corals could not have been older than 1944, which is when the ships went down during World yeah. War II. And so. I think that when it comes to artificial reefs, you touched on one of the most important points and that that's the material. You know, not every material you put in the ocean is a good candidate for an artificial reef. Absolutely reef. not, yeah. There's so many examples, you know, mm -hmm. we've seen subway cars, tires, toilets, you know, those materials, they don't make for good artificial reefs. You really need to think tires. about it. Tires in particular. Like a, yeah, a big storm comes through, they get tossed aside. They roll around, they do what they're supposed to do, they roll, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. Terrible. Okay. Yeah. So. so it's really important to think about the materials that you're working with, and not just materials, but location. So, you know, it's not every platform is a good candidate for an artificial reef, even if it has marine life on it for factors right. such as let's say it's at the base of the Mississippi River, you're gonna have a lot of sediment and runoff and it's maybe not gonna be the best candidate for a reef. 
you know, you want to look at these platforms and especially more of the modern ones that are made of galvanized steel, those don't corrode, you know, the same way that iron and other materials would. So you want to think about what's this platform made of? Because right. Not every platform is going to be a good candidate for an artificial reef. Right. And this one, what what's the story of the one that we see here in this image? Have you guys headed out to it? Yeah, so this is platform Eureka that's behind us in this picture. We had an amazing opportunity to go out. We actually went out with the New York Times to do a little research and um, media work on communicating these really complex ideas about repurposing these structures as, as reefs. And this particular dive was really interesting because you mentioned being able to do research on colonization rates and growth rates on these structures. And in California, that there's so much growth, invertebrate growth that grows on the structures that every couple of years, the oil companies actually have to go down and hose off down to about 60 feet below the water's surface because they're concerned that the additional weight from all the colonization is going to create drag and could compromise the infrastructure. So they oh, actually- there goes my experiment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they do. They go down and they just, they hose it all down. But then we come back, we dive that same platform next year. And the year after, three years, you start to see the small pioneering species. And then after five years, six years, you're almost at full coverage again. And so it's amazing to see how life can recolonize and grow on these structures. Nature heals in a way. And I've heard that some people are, have actually, uh, looked at them as potential sites for, as you're saying, that if they are sort of power washing off things like mussels or you know, oysters and things like that, that they they take those and, and kind of use them in a kind of in an aquaculture aspect. They can trying to use some of these platforms in, in that way too, to kind of, you know, so-called harvest the, um, the invertebrate stuff of them. Yeah. 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 We actually went out with them. Catalina Sea Ranch goes out and they harvest their brood stock from the legs of these platforms. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because the reason why they go so far offshore is that there's some of the purest mussels and scallops you're going to find in California because the others that are near shore are under the influences of runoff, pollution, things like that can that can you know degrade the, the food source. And so offshore you're in a blue water environment and it's better quality. And so they are choosing that to be their site for broodstock collection. It's really interesting. I, I still object to the term harvest <laughs> when it's- That's it, why I did this for you. I know. <laughs> yeah. Air quotes. Um, yeah, because these are wild animals. Yeah. And mm -hmm. They have not been planted there, although there have been discussions about using these existing structures as the place for open ocean aquaculture, but even so, you're taking a bite out of the ocean when you grow animals yes. in pens offshore. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and the mussels and scallops in California, they actually play a really key role in the life cycle of the ecosystems on these platforms. You know, at the very top of the structure is where you have these mussels and scallops, and when they die and those shells fall to the base of the platform, they create these massive shell mounds. Mm -hmm. and are really important nurseries for species such as rockfish, which go mm -hmm. down to shells and lay their eggs. And when those babies hatch, they come back up to the top of the platform. And it creates this really unique circle of life that exists just on one platform. That's really interesting. I'm told it's the biggest rockfish. Oh, goodness. How many species of rockfish are there? Like more than 30 different yeah. kinds? There's so many, yeah. yeah. There's a multitude. But the biggest ones tend to be around the platforms because everywhere else they've been scarfed up. <laughs> yeah, There's it's true. Most of the adult species of rockfish are found on the platforms. As well as the babies down at the bottom. And the babies. <laughs> yeah. So tell us about this. So this is one of our, this is actually from that same day when we were offshore. So you can see that these the upper scaffolding of the jacket has been cleaned down a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. Just got algae and a little bit of, of growth on it there. But this is at the initial descent from the dive. Um, you can see the visibility was pretty amazing on this particular day. Beautiful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So as a diver and an underwater, you know, explorer at heart, diving on these structures is 
an experience like nothing I've I've ever done. You're in this blue water environment. And when you have a hundred foot visibility like this, you really get to see the structure surrounding you. And it's it's quite a cool experience. So I think this picture really, really shows our fans who are divers out there, what it's like to be underwater on one of these structures. And there is more uh, interest in, in kind of recreational diving around these platforms, isn't there? Definitely. It's a hot spot for divers in California. And I, hands down, it's one of my favorite dive sites. It's not very often that you go on a platform or any sort of dive where you're in a blue water setting like that, where you can't see the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, how and deep was this one? Do you... uh, this was on Eureka. I believe Eureka is in about 800 feet of water. Wow. So, <laughs> Don't drop anything. You know, you get, you're only scraping the surface of what's there when you get to go diving on them. And it's, you know, it's the experience of you, if you picture the Empire State Building underwater, if it was just the scaffolding and you're diving through that scaffolding, it's, and you're in a, you know, 360 almost aquarium because there's marine life above you to the sides, below you. It's incredible. So when they're cut off at 85 feet, why? 85 feet from the surface. That was one of the options that you described. Why is it 85 yeah. and not, not deeper or less deep? In fact, I, I would make a case for maintaining the platform as a research station, if you could get away with it. Yeah. All that infrastructure, all that expense, all that. Well, not only that, but you, you know, you'd think that there could be some alternative energy uh, that could be mounted to that some of the existing platforms, be it solar or wind. Right. Uh, Absolutely. You've got that platform to, have to use it, you know, but. Um, what do you right, tell that, people? Like, yeah, so the, that water depth was selected to allow for navigational safety so that ships can safely draft over even in a big swell or big storm and wouldn't have the, wouldn't be interfering or interacting with the structure. So that was kind of the number that was determined there. And in California, there are conversations about an alternative of leaving the entire structure in place and repurposing that top side or what you see from your beach chair into perhaps a platform for um, bird migrations, for alternative energy. They talk about, they've talked about um, storing wave energy batteries up there or installing solar. There are many, many alternatives that can but be like a really cool honeymoon getaway. That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bed and breakfast. You know, we have actually <laughs> stayed on an oil platform. We went on a research expedition to Malaysia where they've actually converted a jackup rig into a hotel. It's and you can yeah. go and stay on the structure and dive below and it was something else. I've never done anything like that. It was certainly a unique. There's lots of potential. Why just destroy them? I mean, again, <laughs> maybe they should not be there in the first place, but since they are there, your challenge is now what do we do? Kind of adaptive mm -hmm. reuse. Yeah. And, yeah. And yeah, no, that's a great point because traditionally these platforms don't belong in the ocean. It's totally yeah. unnatural. Um, it is, yeah. And, and, you know, we don't want to keep building oil platforms. I think where the conversation changes is, well, what do you do at the end of their useful life? Is that the best choice to totally remove them? And I think that's the conversation that we would try and think about because you're totally right. These don't belong in their ocean, in our oceans. They're totally unnatural, but yet they've become into these productive ecosystems. So what's the best choice? What's the best choice for them? Yeah. And to your point, you know, I think each one does have to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, because mm -hmm. if they're not really supporting um, a really rich biodiverse um, ecosystem, or worse yet, if they're hosting a lot of invasive species for, you know, for whatever reason, then, then perhaps they should be pulled out and, and recycle as much of it as possible into other products. Mm -hmm. But when they, they, I don't think they, well, are they sometimes recycled or is it repurposed or are they, is it just trash? You said that they are sometimes moved to a new location and then used as an artificial reef? Certain, certain platforms, you know, some types of platforms, they're actually floating and they can tow them to location to location. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Um, others, you know, when they decide to reef them, sometimes in the Gulf of Mexico, they have designated reefing areas where they might have platforms from other parts of the ocean, but they've decided to place them all into this one. A boneyard. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. But you know, there is some there's, you know, pros and cons with all the options. One of the pros here is, you know, 
that sometimes alleviates conflicts that you get with fishermen. And that's a big part of the culture in the Gulf. And you know, you, the more platforms you have together, you create a bigger reef. The downside is you remove the marine life that was colonizing on it originally. Right. Um, and when they do decide to totally remove it, they take it on shore and they scrap it. So they sell it for the scrap price. And um, right. so in a way they will use that metal for other things. Well, that's true. No? So it's not, it doesn't go like into a landfill, but it, but it's, um, it's still, you, it, there's that balancing act between do we, do we get rid of all the life that's colonize the structure yeah. you know, and recycle it or you know, do we try to maintain it in some way? But at 85 feet, you, know, you take away a lot of that, that growing area too. Um, where, sunlight, sunlight. where the sunlight really penetrates through. Mm -hmm. So um, you, know, you can see how that could be difficult. Have you encountered many of the ones that have been reefed that, that are uh, burdened by um, you know, derelict fishing gear at all? Have you seen that happen? I don't know if we've seen it on a platform ourselves, but we've done yeah. some ROV surveys in the deeper depths of the ocean. Mm. And it's amazing how much fishing line you find on these structures, mm. um, which, you know, it's better than them on these structures than on natural reefs, but we do see a lot of fishing line on these structures. Wait, go back. I want to know who has the pink pins. Oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Very distinctive. I'll bet the you fish can always find me. <laughs> are jealous you got the red ones you got the pink ones <laughs> oh look at this little garibaldi yeah, those are state fish the garibaldi yes you yeah. guys will leave a mark you're yeah. pretty territorial little guys yeah, they'll nip at you. yeah. They, yeah they they make their nest on on some of the beams and cross beams on these california platforms and they're so colorful we definitely try and get close for you know a photo like this one and but if we get too close, they really don't like it. And yeah. they'll let, let you know. And what's cool about this photo when you go between the two is a great example of what it looks like when it's cleaned down to mm -hmm. what it eventually turns into in this photo, which really shows that contrast of how rich these beams become. Right, right. And that's the biggest damsel fish, right? Isn't the Garibaldi yeah. the biggest damsel fish? <laughs> yeah. Fierce little guys. Attitude. Very they're territorial, beautiful. yeah. It's surprising. They're beautiful, beautiful fish. Yeah. Species, even though the species are different, the groups of animals that you see in a coral reef and here on this, in, in, in a tropical situation are comparable. I mean, there are corals here, certain kinds of corals, cold water corals and sponges, obviously. But the thing is, when you get below uh, a few hundred feet, a few hundred meters in the ocean, it's cold. It's California mm -hmm. cold. Yeah. <laughs> Even enough it gets Antarctica Older. cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what you see in the upper 30 meters or so can be quite distinctively different. But the deeper you go, the more, more comparable in terms of the categories of life that you do actually see. Yeah. But plenty of arthropods, you know, little shrimps and crabs, they're just different species. Yeah, but but you're right. It is it is very similar no matter where you go because you do get those big cross sections of different you know categories categories of life, of life mm -hmm. that, that tend to want to uh, settle out on these things. But yeah, it just makes you want to get right in there and, and, oh, and kind of look for look at you know find the tiny little brittle stars and the little shrimp yeah. and everything else that, that lives in each chunk of that. You could watch a section of that platform for hours because you use when you look you start to realize it's moving. There's so much life there. The brittle yeah. stars, the anemones, the fish, in one like little, you know, foot by foot section, you can see so much life. You've just described what diving with her is like because she never moves. She just, she'll like <laughs> focus in on a place and she'll be there, you know, the whole dive and then we'll, we'll move like six meters, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much to see. I know. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, just absolutely. You want to go with a microscope if you could, magnifying glass at least. Exactly. And the longer you look, you see. The more yeah. you see, yeah. Here you guys are getting ready to dive on another platform. That, this is still the Eureka platform? Yes, this is Eureka. Yeah. yeah. But this gives you a good sense of sort of how much uh, topside infrastructure there is as well. That mm -hmm. if you were going to, you know, repurpose something like this, it it's, looks like a fairly complex um, it's, operation. You know, it's actually an engineering marvel mm how -hmm. it has been possible to overcome the issues of 
putting something of this complexity underwater and and often far offshore. Mm -hmm. off, it's incredible. More than, yeah, more than 100 miles out with helicopter pads <laughs> and, you know, fully wired for, for power. And dining is actually pretty darn good because when the crews go out, they stay for weeks at a time. And, you know, they, they <laughs> you want to feed them well so that they'll be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, they are they are a group of professionals that that uh, yeah. deal with these platforms, yeah, I, and you admire their their confidence for sure in terms of making things happen. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. keeping things from happening. Yeah, <laughs> even more right. important. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah it's, it's like a space station. It really is. It's. I mean, some of the largest ones in the Gulf. They have bowling alleys and movie mm -hmm. theaters, wow. and you can have like little towns on there. It's incredible. Yeah. Okay, we got next one. We need to, I think you have, oh, I love this one. Amazing. Yes. And it's those like, are two sheephead there that we see. And again, like another fish that's so distinct to California. It's, it's yeah. Really see that. This looks like a cathedral. I mean, it's just amazing. You, really beauty, beauty and the beast. <laughs> that's yes. it. Yeah. You know, when people see an oil platform or think of an oil platform, this photo is, besides an oil spill, this is typically what they think of. They don't mm -hmm. think of that other photo because who would ever believe that, you know, from your well, beach, this is what it looks like. It's like so many other things that, you know, you, you, you see a vessel out on the ocean, you know, you're really not thinking about what's below the surface. Yeah, what's right. the truth? It, it is one of the biggest challenges that we have in, in thinking about ocean health and restoration is you know getting people to really think about what's below the surface because it's mm -hmm. this is what we it's, see you know that's the ocean the yeah. ocean is not the top it's not even the bottom it's the part in between you know the, the wet part the wet part <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the liquidy the, part yeah. it's filled with life it's just extraordinary diversity is this a video is this a video i think it, it is, is yes voice yeah and these yeah. are sister platforms this is ellie and ellen they're conjoined they're right near eureka Mm -hmm. So that's a, a, like a, a, a walkway? Yes. Yeah. So one's, um, one platform functions to bring the oil up as a sort of a producing platform, and the other one functions as a refinery um, and brings it back to shore. So they each do, do very different things, um, but work together to do that. Mm -hmm. And it really gives you a sense of scale when you see the cranes on them and multiple cranes. It's how large yeah. they are. Multiple yes, stories, okay. all the pilings, you really get an idea of the complexity of these structures. And creative engineering. <laughs> yes, definitely. In California, we only have 27. In the Gulf, when you go down there, you know, in Star Wars, like the X Walkers, that's what these things look like. I mean, mm -hmm. hundreds, yes, hundreds, hundreds. And 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 as thinking about what's laid down on the bottom is is really unbelievable. You know, all the, the miles and miles of pipeline and so forth. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's right. So in the Gulf of Mexico, it's very different. They, they've reefed over 500 platforms. So they have an active rig to reef program in states like Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, where they are actively repurposing these structures into reefs. And they have been over the past 30 years. Um, they've, they've also done a lot of research on the value of these structures as reefs, especially since the Gulf is such a sedimented environment, there's not a lot yeah. of natural hard substrate. And so the structures that these platforms provide is act, has actually become very critical to a lot of their fisheries. And um, it's become you know, necessary as a place for them to spawn, breed, grow to maturity. And they're really utilizing that, that hard substrate that's sticking up off the seafloor. And because of that, they, they've been actively reefing their structures. And I know 500 sounds like a lot, but that's actually only about 11% of all the structures that get decommissioned are turned into reefs in the Gulf. So how many have actually kept the platform above the surface? 
You know, I don't, I don't even know if there's one. Um, I, I know they're working. That's a new concept though, that they're working yeah. to change, which we've been excited about. There's a group called GORI, the Gulf Offshore Research Institute that oh, right. are bring opportunities to keep the top sides in place to either become uh, research facilities or to employ things like um, offshore wind um, or wave energy. So we're really excited about that because there is a lot of value in keeping the top sides if you can, because think about how many research stations are located hundreds of miles offshore. It's really- Ooh, That's the whole point, right? So it's yeah. a, if you can have a place like that, oh, look at this guy, offshore, then it helps to, um, you know, really have that that gift of, of time in some ways that you can, can spend out there and really get to know um, individual animals. And look at this guy. He's, just, he's, <laughs> he's the cleanup crew. The cleanup crew. He's good. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of sea lions that like to hang out on these structures and um, possibly because they come for the food or they come for the resting spot, they can lay up on the little surfaces that are provided right above the right above the sea surface there so we definitely always get they like they're like dogs they like to come kind of like uh big group you were talking about in the gulf yeah, yeah. So kind of blow bubbles yeah, and then they face. will harass you too so. <laughs> yeah totally. they will they will they always seem to be you never see them yourself but in the videos you capture you always notice them in behind you like doing right stuff. yeah i know they like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. right yeah. there yeah they particularly like long hair yeah yeah i'm sure you yeah. have the same problem i do they come up and play with my play with they're my fascinated head. yeah <laughs> but good, good reason to wear a hood or not yeah <laughs> i don't mind so. but uh oh, oh look at this guy it's beautiful oh. These are creatures you don't see flying around on land. There they are. No, yeah, isn't that amazing? Just like a dancer. Yeah. And the sheer number of fish that we see on these platforms, I mean, there, there's been some days, and we see a lot of schooling jack mackerel out there. You feel like you're parting a curtain of fish. It's it's mm -hmm. amazing how they all congregate there. and. You know, you know, those schools of fish, they're not making their permanent homes on these structures, but they're using it for refuge. And it's, it's fascinating when you see that, and, you know, it's, as a diver, it's not very often you get to see, you know, ecosystems that are that rich with marine life. Like in this video, I mean, you, it's, it's a wall of fish. It's amazing. Right. And it, I think, you know, perhaps it, in the open water, the, the fish don't, you know, it's not, there's no, um, no place to hide, no place to hide really. But when they're around these structures, it kind of you know breaks up the uh, hunting pattern that a, if a predatory fish might be chasing them, or even a sea lion coming through. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're pretty maneuverable, but but it just kind of gives them that little break that they can get behind something or, or change direction a little bit better. Yeah, so when I see the nice sea lions, it's hard to believe they have spines the way they move. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. I see you have now the flippers that match the encrusting uh, coral. <laughs> yes. You know, yeah. I try and do that on my dives is match yeah. to the corals that I see. Yeah. Very well, nice. pink anemones. They're so anemones beautiful. Yeah. Well, you know, in California waters, it gets so murky. I always want to have fins on so that people know where I am, you know? So yeah. this, we got lucky sometimes with good viz, but there's been days you go out there, you maybe have 20 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it really varies. Look at this forest of anemones. You know, yeah, you need to put a little them. further down. Yeah, this is about as deep sure. as you go as recreational divers on these platforms. This is around 100 feet. Yeah. Um, you can see those nutrient, those white fluffy anemones, they're not really farther up. You only encounter them as you go deeper like this. So you do mm -hmm. see, like you were talking about, Sylvia, the tiered ecosystems as you go deeper. Right. So not everybody likes the same amount of light. The food varies. Mm -hmm. Must vary as well. Yeah, how how are the currents coming through here? Ooh, they can be rough. <laughs> they can be really rough. I, we've gotten really lucky with very calm days, and then we've had days where there was massive swell. And when you're doing your safety soft coming back up, you kind of have to hold on to the structure in order to maintain a. a so you don't have the elevator situation. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I come up feel a little bit seasick after something like that. Yeah. If you can just fill your mind into thinking or not thinking about what this structure actually is, it, it's beautiful. I mean, it's aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. 
you think about the structures that humans create as a celebration of art or of life or whatever. Imagine. Life will find a way. And on land, yeah, you might get lichens encrusting and maybe a little mold here and there, <laughs> but moss can grow on, on an old house, but the amazing diversity of life that sets up housekeeping, just about anything you put in the ocean is, is a stunt. Yeah, it really is. It's life there in the ocean is very opportunistic. Um, and I think that's what makes these oil platforms quite special is that's just a lot of real estate for marine life on these structures. As Amber was sharing, you know, hard substrate, it can be rare in the ocean. Mm -hmm. sort of, that's 800 feet tall and complex with multiple beams and cross beams. Life is extremely opportunistic in the ocean. It's almost like <laughs> an artificial sea mount in a way. But the, yes. the, the, the yeah. reality of it. But when you think of how much has been invested in putting them in place, I mean, it's, it's these are not. Oops, uh -oh, what happened there? <laughs> I think that's our, that was our last one, maybe. No. Yeah, yeah, that was our last. Yeah, that was our last one. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. Here we go. Stop sharing. <laughs> start talking. Start talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one thing that we haven't really touched on uh, in this discussion is, you know, a lot of what we're dealing with is the top side structures or the upper portions of these platforms. But equally as interesting and unique is some of the work we've been doing in the super deep sea. Mm -hmm. We've been remotely operated vehicle. Um, research expeditions on platform in infrastructure that's around, we've gone down to 7,000 feet, which, which blows my mind that we have equipment on the ocean at those depths, how they got yeah. it there, how they built it is incredible. But what's unique, and you know, as a scientist, you don't often get funding or money to go down there and look at this equipment and look at this infrastructure to see what's down there. And we've been fortunate to be able to work with some of these companies to do these value assessments to see what's down there and what are your, what are the impacts that you're having when you build or when you remove from those environments because it's so different from shallow water environments the impacts that you have down there they last you know not a few years they can last you know 100 years yeah so like we're seeing with the the impacts with the, the, of the proposed deep sea mining it's you know the deeper you go it's it's a it's a quieter environment cold. colder environment dark and and yeah. the animals beautiful. and beautiful and it's it, yeah and you get very um, you know very homebody animals that or or animals that don't uh, don't have a lot to to survive on so they've got to they, again they have to be very opportunistic and and so it's a it's a big impact when you start moving well, things the, around the whole realm of chemosynthesis in the absence of light we're just beginning to get tuned in to how do the creatures in the absence of light, in the deep sea, in the cold, how do they make a living? In addition to the rain of stuff that comes down from above, based on photosynthesis, the role of chemosynthesis is just beginning to attract enough attention to say maybe in the greater scheme of things, it's uh, it has a significant part of food nutrient cycling cycling it's and true urban capture it's true and one one unique coral species that we see down at these depths you know not seven thousand but down around a thousand feet is lophelia pertusa and this species of coral it doesn't need light to survive it's one of the species mm -hmm. that's a filter feeder and i'd never really been introduced to that species and we see them all over the infrastructure down there again because in the gulf you know substrate's rare but it's fascinating to see a coral like that. You know, if you brought it up to the surface, it looks like what we see when corals are bleached and dead, you know, mm -hmm. when this belly leaves the coral. But down there, that's how they look. And it's just such an alien adaption to see that. It's so unique. Well, they think that we're alien adaptions. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yes. no. Yes. Well, alien. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Considering all life on Earth, that most of it is in the ocean, we who live. <laughs> Up here in the air, we're the odd ones. Yeah, it's true. That's <laughs> really. very true. So, what is the so when one of these uh, platforms is you know toppled or just cut off or however they cement it off? 
what is the ongoing obligation to uh, to inspect and and make sure that they're not uh, you know leaking or creating any uh, damage once they're sealed? So the platform jacket is well traditionally in the United States it gets donated to departments of fish and wildlife. So Louisiana, Texas, California, if we start a rig streak program would take on the liability for that platform structure. But as Emily mentioned, the liability for that well is the you know, is responsibility of the oil company in perpetuity. So they go and you know, they have maintenance and, and sort of routine checks that they have to do to see if there's any leakage, but really, it would come to the surface or come to shore. There would be indications that there was an issue and an oil company would be responsible for any of the environmental damage associated with that. All right, that's just, I mentioned it because I was curious about, you know, this uh, ongoing use of dispersants and, and a push to start using them sub C. Um, it says, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's good that, you know, they're kind of maintained in a way that if there is a problem, that's it will be recognizable or at least have some sort of a, you know, inspection schedule for, to go out and look at them, which could have some ongoing scientific benefits as well to go down. And yeah, do that's, that's where we do a lot of our research is actually tying into those maintenance um, inspections is, you know, we started working with these companies to be like, hey, you're already mobilizing offshore. You're already spending the money to go down there, send an ROV down there. Could you add on a few extra transects for us so that we can at what you're seeing down there, you know, it's a great way for us to see what's actually out there, understand mm -hmm. how marine life is colonizing on these structures, and get a better sense of what the impact's going to be if you choose to remove it or leave it in place. And when they remove them, are they are they uh, just cutting them, uh, you know, with like a subsea torch, or are they actually still detonating them in some cases to, to remove them? Yeah, it, it depends on the, you know, the area and what sort of restrictions they have in place, but they are still using both me both methods of a cutter and also using explosives. Yeah, kind of bad. Removal. Yeah. Both yeah. Cases, so especially it would explosives. be very, very uh, detrimental. Yeah. So, I, you know, the, the excuse for cutting them off 80 feet down, 85 feet down is for navigation. Yes. But, wouldn't they be more obvious if they just leave them in place? <laughs> there's yes. Still a, there's still a hazard, even at 85 feet. There's some of it's, these big, big ships that have a greater really drag fast. than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. You know, they use navigational buoys, but yeah, obviously having it stick out of the water, it's a lot more obvious. <laughs> you would think. <laughs> <laughs> But what's been interesting is, you know, in some of our conversations with California's fishermen, we've learned that, you know, they used to be very, very anti-rigs to reefs. A lot of the fishermen, especially in the Gulf, but also in California, especially the trawling community. And, you know, trawling, it's like taking a net the size of a football field, dragging along the ocean bottom. It's, it's really awful. awful. And mm -hmm. so you can understand why they wouldn't want a big oil platform in the way, you know, that's blocking them from trawling. So it used to be that a lot of the fishermen were really anti-rigs to reefs. But what's unique is as, as trawling, especially in California, has been slowly grandfathered out of permits, a lot of the fishermen that are hook and line, they want the whole structure to stay in place. They recognize that unique life cycle value that starts at the top, works its way down and back up. And they recognize the fisheries production value of these platforms. And for us, that's been interesting to observe how that sentiment has changed amongst that demographic. And, um, you know, for us personally, we don't want to see the trawling anyways. So for us, we kind of exactly. like platforms yeah. are there, you know, that won't get yeah. across <laughs> that. So thank you. Unique. We've I got some do without those lines too. Yeah. We've got, <laughs> we've got some uh, questions that people are queuing up here. So we can kind of jump on into those, I guess. You ready? You ready, ready for some for questions? Some questions? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, I'll look through them here. Um, MT says, marine life can lead to corrosion and break of marine structures. What should be done? So I think, I mean, that's just kind of a byproduct of, of time. You know, eventually these, these structures will degrade um, and break down. That's, that's sort of the 
it's what we're seeing a lot of <laughs> happens with shipwrecks over time. You know, the Titanic is the gradually, Titan yeah, gradually decaying and falling apart. Um, we're unfortunately seeing it with a lot of uh, subsea munitions and, and things like the DDT barrels out at the by Catalina Island. Uh, yeah, they're breaking the, down. But, but yeah, but I mean, radioactive wastes as well. They're put in barrels and that eventually corrode. corrode. Yeah, corrode. And yeah. that's what happens when you put metal in the ocean. It's trying to corrode. Mm -hmm. May, so it's may take a couple of lifetimes of humans anyway. But I guess that comes back to your point about being selective, that if you're going to leave a, a piece of metal in the ocean, that you try to choose one that will degrade over time. And and eventually, you know, some of these animals will and reefs will kind of incorporate over the top of it. And even as it degrades, the, the skeletons of the corals and shells and so forth will create substrate itself. Right. Yeah. It a long while. For eight yeah. Months. <laughs> yeah. But. During the production life of a platform, the oil companies are are aware of the corrosion issues. And so they actually have cathodic protection systems that they put in place. These ano anodes actually attract corrosion, which decreases the um, the structural degrade degrading over time. But those those actually need to be replaced every five, 10 years or so. So when the structure is reefed, the, they're, they're no longer replacing those mechanisms for slowing cor corrosion. Right. So you mentioned this earlier, Sylvia, that the mass of invertebrate life actually acts as a sealer around the structure that protects it and increases longevity. And they have done some studies on this in the Gulf where they anticipate that a structure that's reefed without the cathodic protection could remain in the water column without needing any maintenance for 300 years. But the truth is, is that none of these structures have been in the water column for 300 years. So we really don't know what that impact is gonna be long-term. And in many, many cases, we look to other structures like shipwrecks or barrels or other materials that have been in the water column longer and use that as kind of ga a gauge to understand how these structures might interact with the water column and degrade over time. And the ships, ships as well. When you have a pretty idea where some of the big ships anyway have gone down, hmm. but none of the, I mean, metal ships are relatively new. Right. Mm -hmm. Replacing, there's still some wooden craft out there. But oh yeah. <laughs> quite a lot. Yeah, but yeah, the new materials. Yeah. But yeah, as you're mentioning the you know the cathodic protection, it's used in, in so many ways, just on 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 recreational boats, on ships, on ROVs. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and so it really does slow down uh, the corrosion. There's another question or two. Yeah, there are. So the Olivia says, "What oil platform in California is next on the list as a candidate for reefing?" I'm from Santa Barbara, and I'm hoping the platform Holly could be next. Well, so California, we have a rigs reefs law. It was passed in 2010, but since that time, we haven't reefed any of our platforms. And that's for a variety of reasons. Um, a lot of it was public perception of this program. It wasn't warmly embraced the way it was in the Gulf of Mexico. But what's been unique, and you mentioned Platform Holly, Amber and I have been sitting in a lot of the town hall meetings discussing Platform Holly. Um, and for those of you that don't know, Platform Holly it's a platform off of Santa Barbara. The company Venico filed for bankruptcy after a burst pipeline. And right. now the state of California needs to make decision as to how to decommission it. And that's a unique case because they filed for bankruptcy. So now it's kind of fallen to the state to make some of the major decisions regarding its eventual fate. Um, and so the conversations with the public for the first time since we've been working on this project have been positive, which we're really excited about that people are starting to change perceptions on this program. You know, I don't know if Platform Holly will make the best case for reefing, um, only because it's very shallow. I believe it's only in 85 feet. So they might need to take oh, wow. an alternative location. Coming um, off of 85 feet. <laughs> no. Yeah, so you yeah. cut it down to the seabed. <laughs> but, you know, there, there are, you know, the California platforms, they're saying that in the next five to 10 years, they're going to be completely removed, all of them. So we're gonna start seeing this question and these decisions come up a lot more frequently in the next 10 years. Definitely. Blanca is asking, um, how are you handling your job since COVID began? 
So you guys still able to get offshore at all? Or oh man, not as much as we like as we would like. Uh, definitely have been limited to what kind of diving we can do, but we've really taken this time to lean in to using remotely operated vehicles. So we're using them on both the industry side, collecting data on our platform structures all the way down to the super deep sea, like Emily mentioned. But we've also um, partnered with Deep Trekker. They are a manufacturer of personal ROVs. So they're smaller uh, kind of you can use them for your own sort of exploration. And we use them for our nonprofit foundation as a way to get offshore and then live stream back to classrooms or be able to connect with, with kids and communities around the United States to talk to them about these ecosystems, both artificial and natural ecosystems. So that's been a really cool tool for us to use during the COVID time. Yeah, they're a good, they're a good tool all the time. Yeah, but, you know all about that. I'm yeah, I know we had a lot of discussions sure. about, about uh, what RV can we get, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I know. Go good. Deep, go deep. Yeah, that's great. So we have an, an anonymous question. Uh, how can you quantitatively distinguish between production and attraction phenomenon based on fish diversity data alone? Well, I can speak to on the platforms um, from that perspective, how we've been looking at this question, because you're, that's such an age old question, production versus attraction. And how do you know? Um, and one of the ways that we've been investigating this question is through something called stable isotope chemistry, which is basically a fancy way of saying you are what you eat. So we <laughs> go and look at the gut of what into the fish and see what it's been eating to observe if what it's been eating throughout its lifetime actually originated from the platform itself. And that's one of the tools that we can use to help understand what's going on here. And the truth is it's a mix. Platforms are attracting marine life and they're producing marine life. Um, and the tools that we have at our disposal to answer that question, they're getting better and better. Yeah, have you guys been using any of the eDNA? We have not, but I'm really yeah. interested to learn more about how the potential for that, because it's such an interesting, interesting research opportunity. Yeah. yeah. All right. The, the growth on the rigs certainly represents something that didn't, just didn't stop by. It, they set up housekeeping and they also provide a, a source of sustenance mm -hmm. and shelter for the home bodies. Mm -hmm. It's similar on a coral reef. There are some that come because that's where the, the groceries are. <laughs> they move in, move out, but others, quite a few, make it their home. And the, the rigs actually become, as they're called, reefs. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, they just become a, a wellspring of, of creatures who would not naturally be in the open sea? Mm -hmm. Your answer, both absolutely spot on. How, how you measure quantitatively the, in any moment in time, how much, how many are visitors and how much is, is there because the, rig, the reefs are there, the rigs are there. I suppose you could do what you're doing is come up with an educated guess. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. As accurate as you could in a laboratory experiment, but you can still come up with a pretty yeah. logical, <clears throat> defensible estimate. Absolutely. Rachel says, I'm a California diver. I've dove a few of the reefs that you've mentioned. Growing up here, I've watched workers get shipped to and from platforms every day. I've also been a safety diver at local aquarium for nine years. Since profit is always an incentive and people are more interested in wild whale watching these days, is there any chance you thought about pursuing an investor to make the platforms into an open ocean aquarium? Hmm. I have not heard that, that proposal before. <laughs> yes, I have not heard of that proposal before either. <laughs> well, I guess it builds a case for, you know, for keeping the, like the whole structure intact and then making it, you know, like say sort of a, a, a dive resort or a, a uh, place to come visit. Maybe you can make a, a vertical aquarium tube to go down and you could elevator people up and down to see the fish that aren't divers. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> go all the way down to 800 feet. No, 
Just in an elevator. You know, <laughs> yeah. submersible. We'll just have a stationary submersible take people down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sort of is, but the yeah, wow. using the ocean as the aquarium. Yeah. It's, it's a big yeah. Problem. Anyway. Yeah, that would be that would be very interesting. It, it well kind of makes me think about something we haven't talked about, which is sort of the cost savings associated with reefing. Because mm -hmm. you can imagine if an oil company is responsible financially for removing an entire structure. If they're able to leave a portion of it or all of it in place, they're going to be saving some costs. And according to our rigs to reef law, a portion of that cost savings actually goes back into the state. So in California, that rate is between 65 to 85% of the cost savings goes back to the state. And if 23 of California's 27 platforms were to be reefed, that would be over a billion dollars coming back into the state. So that's a lot of a lot of cost savings. And that was a recent estimate, I think from 2016, where they were looking at the economics here. And that cost savings would go to fund departments of fish and wildlife. It would go into a marine, uh, an endowment for marine preservation and conservation. And it would really go towards funding you know, ocean education, ocean research, and ocean protection in the state, which is really important. And perhaps maybe they start thinking about ways of engaging the public, like turning these into destinations and an aquarium offshore destination or what have you. I think they could really use this opportunity to be creative and maybe a great platform for getting people to be inspired and to care about the ocean. Absolutely. And that's what it always comes down to is inspiring them to care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the big gap. Yeah. So uh, we've got a few more questions we'll try to get through before we completely run out of time. <laughs> um, Bianca is asking, what inspired you to pursue this job? That's for both of you guys. Well, uh, for me, you know, I, I did, I definitely wasn't born thinking I'm going to study oil platforms. <laughs> I love uh, playing with them as a child. You didn't have a yeah. making out of a Lego or something. <laughs> uh, you know, I always, always like so many of us in this career space, always had a deep love and fascination with our oceans. I grew up by this, the ocean and I come from a family of divers. My dad was a dive master. He got us all diving by the age of 12 and very fortunate to be able to explore a lot um, through that method. You know, diving is such an excellent and unique opportunity to explore part of the world that so many of us never get a chance to even think of exploring. Um, and that really, I've always been in love with the ocean from that perspective. But as I've gotten older, and you know, you always hear so much negative things about what's happening to our oceans, and there are so many negative things happening to our oceans. But I found myself becoming inspired by unique and creative opportunities to manage our oceans. And that's what inspired me about Rigs to Reefs was it happened at a time for me when I was working on the BP oil spill. I mean, talk about the greatest, the largest um, impactful spill that's ever happened to our oceans. And yet it's also when I learned about how unique the ecosystems are on these structures. And it really changed my perception about how we can creatively manage our oceans in a way where there's win-win solutions. Um, in, in these situations where it's not so clear cut mm -hmm. and the unique opportunities to have some onus on our impacts on the ocean, because the reality is we're all responsible for those offshore oil platforms. If you've ever, Absolutely. Car, if you you car. Plastic, <laughs> we all have that responsibility and maybe there's a way that we can start to mitigate for our own fault in those oceans. And that's really what inspired me was this unique, unique take on how we can protect our oceans. And plus being able to do it with your best friend. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. It's always awesome. I, I would say that I've been sort of followed a similar passion and, and trajectory there. I have um, definitely come to a place today in my career where I am really inspired by breaking down the boundaries between us, us and them, scientists against industry, a conservation against the government or some, I think that we need to find ways to work together. And that's where the solutions and really the future of ocean conservation lies. And so it's exciting to be working at that intersection here and on this issue. That's awesome. Making a difference. Christina, <laughs> Christina is asking uh, if you have any information about something similar uh, maybe happening for the Caribbean. Uh, 
She's writing from Margarita Island in Venezuela, a country where many oil spills have happened. So is there any uh, you know, kind of international effort, um, particularly in the Caribbean, for the reefing programs or what's going on yeah. there? Yeah. yeah, it's amazing because there are oil platforms in almost every ocean, maybe not down in Antarctica, but almost yes. the ocean. Say yeah, no. <laughs> Stop I it. Hope never. <laughs> never. <laughs> so you would think that with all this offshore infrastructure that a rig reef program would be a widely accepted and known program, but it's really not the case. There are only a few unique places that have a rig reef program, the Gulf being where it's most active. And then there are places where, where they're developing it right now. So in Thailand or in, in Malaysia or over in on the West Coast of Africa, they're just starting to, to think about this idea. And, and they really are looking to the U.S. for best practices and, and inspiration for how to do it correctly in a way that conserves their ocean resources. And I think the same could be um, seen in the, the Caribbean Sea. So maybe there's an opportunity you know, people could reach out to the pair of you and, and kind of uh, see if they could ignite something in these other areas where there's mm -hmm. not currently a program and, and try to be an ambassador uh, to- Yes, to we would it. love that. Yeah. You've made some films, have you not? Short films about the work you're doing? Yes, that we have. Yeah, we have. We did, um, well, we have a YouTube channel, Science CTV, where we take people diving on some of the platforms on some of our research expeditions, but we made a film, Transecting Borneo, that um, documented our research expedition to that platform in Malaysia we were talking about where they've converted it into a hotel. Um, what was interesting about the experience for us is, yeah, first of all, what a wild concept. And when you're on it, it moves. So the whole time, sure, yeah. moving a little bit, you, know, and you are emerged in that environment. Like they still had salt water showers. I think we were the saltiest we've ever been. After it was that very rustic. <laughs> very rustic. Yes. So what's unique is that in that area of Malaysia, it's also home to Sipadan Island, which yeah. if you're here, you have to add that to your bucket list of what an incredible, incredible space for diving. Just inc incredibly protected, but rich with marine life. And then right next to it, you have this oil platform they've converted it for ecotourism. So it really made it for a nice juxtaposition to understand, is this a good thing to do with oil platforms? Does this make sense to do with an oil platform? And how does that compare to some of the natural reefs in the area? That was a fun, it was a fun experience to mm -hmm. do together. That's awesome. Maybe if there are links to these programs, your program, your, that, that we should celebrate that. Yeah, I think Gigi's got them in the yeah. chat. Okay, so, <laughs> so listen up, everybody. Yeah, check the chat. <laughs> check the chat. Uh, Aletha is asking: Are companies generally open to the research opportunities when you approach them? Generally, surprisingly, yes. I would say that they are. I, I mean, we've. I think I've been kind of surprised in this journey with working with industry and how receptive and actually excited many of their team members are. They are not, um, you know, sitting up in a, in a remote part of the world, who, you know, not caring about the ocean. That's really not the case. In most cases, they take their kids out on the water over the weekends and they enjoy our oceans and they want to protect them. And so, they get excited when we come to work with them because they you know, see an opportunity to maybe learn something they didn't know about their structures. And um, so thus far, we've had really good experiences. That's excellent. That's good. So EM's asking, are there certain companies, countries that are more responsible and, oops, hold on, what happened to my thing here? <laughs> and open to doing the right thing? Are there politicians who are more enlightened about the options and care about what's going on that we could write to and support. Yes, there's definitely um, some certain companies. I mean, a lot of the oil companies are interested in this idea. You know, for them, it's cost savings. So there's obviously going to be an interest from them. But actually, surprisingly, when Amber and I have worked with a lot of the companies, they're eager to know too. They get pretty excited to see what sort of marine life is down there. Um, and a lot of these countries, you know, what's unique to the U United States is we have private oil companies. A lot of countries, the, the oil companies are run by the state. So mm -hmm. in situations, um, 
they tend to be more open to how we manage their offshore resources in terms of, you know, they can, they have control over how they're managed. So it's like the Gulf of Thailand, Malaysia, we're seeing a lot more interest in how they can convert their platforms into reefs. They're looking at developing models to help predict which platforms could be good reefs. They're engaging with local universities, especially in the Gulf of Thailand to get students out there researching these platforms. So, but then there's areas like the North Sea, which is very, very against rigs to reefs, um, vehemently against rigs to reefs. Um, not because it wouldn't make for a good program there. You know, the ecosystems there, they're cold, they're turbulent, but they're very, very rich ecosystems there. Um, but there's a lot of stakeholders that, you know, you have multiple countries that manage that resource that can make it more complicated. Fishing is very, very big there that they don't like these structures to be there in the first place. Um, but it, it's an area that has a lot of potential because they've got hundreds of oil platforms like the Gulf of Mexico. So we definitely see, or even in California versus Gulf of Mexico, you know, Gulf of Mexico, they have welcomed this program with open arms. California, it's been a little bit more challenging. Um, but I think the best way if you want to get involved or learn about how you can support this program is definitely writing to your senators and writing to your different representatives, because sometimes they might not be informed about this program. You know, it's, it is relatively new. Um, and the problem of decommissioning is kind of new. We're moving away from fossil fuels. So we're, we're looking at removing these structures that that decision time is coming up. Right. So we have an anonymous uh, question. Does the sediment surrounding oil rigs can often be contaminated with tons of hydrocarbons and heavy metals. How are those risks being managed and how do they impact the reefing effort? Yeah, so this is, this is a really tough one because you, when you have you know, contaminated sediments, it's a terrible thing. And there is really not many easy ways to clean that up. And what we found is that they do a lot of sediment testing around these platforms. They don't do it just when it comes to decommissioning. They're actually having to do it while the structure is active and producing. And not, not every platform has contaminated soils at its base. That's not always the case. And so again, case by case basis, looking at, looking at the soils. But when you're reefing the structure, you're usually not going to be, you're not impacting the seafloor. You're just reefing that structure that's above the seafloor, you know, coming out of the seafloor. And in fact, they were looking at this in, in California and there were some contaminated um, sediments near the base of a structure. And if they were to completely remove that structure, they would have to disturb those sediments. And a lot of that would come out and in, into the water column right. and that would be really negative for the environment. So what they actually did is they ended up with these particular platforms is cutting them off um, a couple of feet above the sediment so that they wouldn't disturb those sediments and therefore wouldn't be releasing a lot of that impact. And to go about making that decision is a lengthy process. It takes many, many years where they go through a set of alternatives, usually through, um, depending on where you are in California, we have the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA. And it's a process that where they, the government and the you know, environmental specialists are evaluating their options to determine which one will have the least impact on the environment. And so in this particular case study I just shared, that that was the best way to deal with, with those contaminated sediments. I remember in discussions with Hillary Housel, who's based in Santa Barbara and has been diving the rigs for many years. And at first was not aware of the contamination created by the drilling muds that tend to accumulate with toxic consequences. And it, um, a lot of this has just been learned as, as the industry developed um, after the fact. Now we got a problem, now what do we do? Not anticipating before what the consequences would be of using the, the the, well, the drilling muds have toxic materials and other other things that are associated with the 
operations are likewise called polluting, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, but now we know we need to do business differently. It's need to do better. Yeah. You need to do, you know, now you can't make an excuse anymore that we didn't know. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now we do know. <laughs> All right. We've got a couple more questions and we, if we're a little Ooh. past the top of the hour, but uh, Casey's asking, what are the impacts to the benthic communities in the Gulf after the rigs are reefed? Well, in the case that a platform would be reefed and placed onto its side, that's when you would, you know, first of all, that would only make sense if you're doing that in an area where there's not reefs scattered all about, because if you placed this massive structure, it's going to smother and kill those reefs. So fortunately in the Gulf, it's a very muddy environment. Um, but, you know, you can't discount, there's things living in the sediment, you know, there's a lot of marine life going on there. So oh. place these structures, it, it will impact them. Um, just like you place anything on the seafloor, the problem is they have a much larger footprint when you topple them. Um, so fortunately, what we try and do when they select a platform for reefing is what's the best option for reefing? Does it make sense to tow it to a designated reefing area? Or does it make more sense to topple it on its side right there or leave it standing in place? Personally, I like the option where we can leave it standing in place. Um, sometimes that can create more navigational issues, but you maintain more of the structure, you maintain more of that marine life. And also vertical structure, marine life is more attracted, attracted and can produce more on vertical structure versus structure very low to the seafloor. But to answer your question, you know, it's something that you have to think about very carefully because you don't want to impact at least beyond the unavoidable impacts of what's on the seafloor. Yeah, there's the impression that if it's a sandy mud bottom, there's nothing there. <laughs> right. <laughs> Full of stuff. If, if you really look, I, there was a, a study in the Persian Gulf by Saudi Aramco in the 1970s of what looked like just empty sand. And they naturally engaged graduate students to do this. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Count the little creatures, not the ultra microscopic ones, those, those you could actually see, like the polychaete worms and the burrowing mollusks and the crustaceans and the this and the that and the other thing. And they came up with like half a million in a, in a cubic meter. It's an Amazing. area you can, you can embrace with your arms. Amazing. So, wow. It, it, from the surface, it looks like, you know, Mud. you might see some little holes <laughs> peppering the surface, but it's a metropolis. Mud it really is. is. Did you say mud truffle? <laughs> I, I did not. You did. You did. <laughs> mud truffle. I'm remembering that. That's great. That's awesome. All right. One last question. Okay. Here it's you from go. From an anonymous person who says, "Are these reefs subject to the same issues as the shallow water reefs with ocean warming?" Yes, they are. They are just as. All reefs are impacted by changing climate. So are the artificial ones. And you know, there has been some thought that perhaps because an active platform has a little bit of shade because you've got that top side that shades the reef that perhaps that might uh, make for cooler water temperatures for those corals. But a lot of research still has to be done on that hypothesis. So we do know that it, those reefs are still being impacted. Yeah. If you want to change the nature of life on earth, change the temperature, change the That's chemistry, true. you change everything. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you both. Thank you so much, so for, much for having us. Yeah. Oh, I really nice. enjoyed it. We should go diving together. We and should. That sounds good. great. We would love that. We'll take a little submarine. Yeah, let's take a submersible down. To the bottom. I would love that. We could do that for sure. That was your class. <laughs> Go deep. Go deep. Before we close today, I just wanted to say thank you to all of our guests and our producer, the Ocean Elders, mm -hmm. and uh, mostly to everyone out there in the community who keeps diving in with us uh, <laughs> week after week or month <laughs> after month, joining us here in the library. Um, dive in really feels like home to us, and I hope it feels like home to you too. Um, water connects us all, and we're very grateful to everyone. We're going to be back next time with. 
Erica Hilton, who's an artist, and she's going to be talking about her use of ocean plastics in art and how mm. water inspires her. And until next time, please remember to take care of the ocean. As if your life depends on it. Because it, it does. does. It does. It does. <laughs> <laughs> thank you amber thank you emily thanks everyone we'll see you next thank time thank you both thank Bye, you Liz so much Sylvia. thank you Bye.